Warning, all attendees are in listen-only mode. So welcome to Agile is 21st Century Compliance. My name is Carlos Leyva. I'm CEO of Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the Hippie Survival Guide. I'm also attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. You can tell this is a revisiting webinar because that's an old, uh, old picture of me. Uh, Martin will be uh, mon monitoring the chat for questions, as he always does. Uh, our director of operations, Martin Gwynn. The handouts he told me are in in the handout section, so there's a PDF there. If you want the slides, a copy of the slides, and you can just click there uh, and download them. So here's our agenda. We're going to cover uh, the learning objectives, a little background, why Agile is 21st century compliance. Essentially, you have to have a repeatable process, assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report. This is actually a process that we adopted from NIST and, and uh, kind of simplified it a little bit. Uh, go over some uh, definitions and then show you some agile uh, project plans that we put together for our subscribers so you get a little feel for what an agile uh, project would look like, what, what's a sprint and, and so forth. Uh, Again, we're going to take questions as we go, so uh, Martin will periodically stop me uh, when, when there's questions and we'll answer them as we go. So here are the learning objectives. We want to provide a foundational understanding of the Survival Guide's Agile Compliance Methodology. Okay, um, We started using this term a couple years ago. Now more and more people are using Agile with respect to compliance. Agile actually came out of urban planning like in the in the 50s, and then the software industry adopted it, and now Agile um, has been adopted for compliance and for marketing, and it's just that the the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve need these repeatable processes, these quick starts. We're not solving the kind of easy problems like building bridges and things like that that we. We, we now call tame problems because we understand the physics, mathematics, the calculus. We've, as mankind, have built thousands of bridges. Okay, so the methodology here is the end game that you you know that you have that you adopt an agile, repeatable, and verifiable risk management process um, that will drive your HIPAA compliance initiative. In order to adopt any methodology, you need to be familiar with the grammar, the lingo. Which we can go over that. We're going to show some examples so you learn by seeing, doing. Mostly what Agile teaches you is that you learn by doing. Uh, and hopefully you're going to have a compliance team, you know, getting things done. Uh, even though sometimes it may end up being a team of one, you're definitely going to have to collaborate with other people um, in the organization, really, if this is going to be at all successful. So the objective is to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of what immediate steps can be taken to launch your Agile HIPAA compliance program. So here's a little background. We're going to Agile would apply to your entire uh, initiative, which would cover the three rules: the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. Okay, Agile definitely applies to uh, building a good compliance story, right? Which is really nothing more than improving your organization's ability to do to deliver visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance better and better and better over time. That in itself is agile, right? And the most important thing you can do is get started on your good story. What's a no story? Well, that's willful neglect land, right? If all you have is that three ring binder that you dusted off, uh, you know, and that you had prior to the High Tech Act, and you haven't done anything since the High Tech Act was promulgated um, now over seven years ago, then you're likely in willful neglect. If you haven't done a risk assessment, you're likely in willful neglect. If you haven't named a privacy or security officer, that would be, you would be in no story land. You have no compliance story to tell. Good story land is where you're actually probably going to be forever because being fully compliant is just a kind of aspirational goal. Why? Because your operational um, environment changes, because the threat landscape changes, because there may be additional material changes in the law. You really, this is a type of project that you're really, really never done uh, with, okay? So, but you definitely want to get into that, that good story veil as quick as you can. So let's back up a little bit. What are we really trying to do, though? What, you know, what, what, what's the policy? What's the public policy objectives 
of HIPAA privacy and security rules and breach notification, right? Partly, and, and, and what the security rule says is to reduce risk to a level that is reasonable and appropriate. Reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, et cetera, et cetera. That's the flexibility approach built into the security rule at 164.306. Okay, so that's sort of what HHS has built in to try to allow um, the security rule to scale from a small ambulatory practice to a large hospital. Okay, um, the reality is that that HHS HHS built in the flexibility principle so that there would be some wiggle room for small practices, but it's a practical matter. There's not all that much wiggle room, so there's no such thing as you know a, a HIPAA light for small providers or for small business associates. That's really a misnomer and a myth. And and so um, I believe the flexibility principle, although it's important, it didn't really achieve what I believe HHS had hoped that it would achieve, uh, at least not in its entirety. As a practical matter, though, what we're trying to do is Katrina-proof your practice. Could your practice or your business, if you're a BA and you're, you have PHI, that, uh, that you use to perform a business function on behalf of a covered entity, could it survive Katrina? What if Katrina hit, right? Now, I know how many lawyers lost all their files during Katrina. The number was about 70%, just lost, completely lost all their files. And I believe that, that small medical practices, that number was about the same, okay? Completely lost all your patient PHI. Now, remember, Katrina, it's 2005. The cloud was barely coming alive, you know? and People weren't storing stuff on the cloud, so they didn't have these kind of backups that we now have access to, right? But the goal was you still had backups. You just had it was a more you know brick and mortar way of doing it. You had this company that would come pick up your tapes if you were doing it right. It would take the tapes off site. Though that off site place was built like a fortress, should have survived a Cat Five, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is, even even the federal courts lost a lot of their files when Katrina hit because a lot of the files were in the basement. Okay. But this webinar we're specifically talking about agile compliance. Before we do that, let's talk about why most projects fail. And most projects fail, including a, a HIPAA compliance initiative, because of people process challenges that have very little to do with the underlying technologies at all. Okay? So your HIPAA compliance initiative is a people process uh, initiative com with respect to complexity more than it is a technology uh, initiative, although technologies, plural, will help. And there's certain places where you absolutely have to have them. Okay, so you should think of a security rule implementation more as a change project. It's learning how to effectively manage risk is really a big part of that change. So the program that you implement, the way you go about managing risk, and the way you go about thinking about your program is important, okay? And we're uh, proposing that you do that in an agile manner because things change too quick uh, and you can't do things in a what's been called a waterfall uh, model where you do step one and then step two and then step three. Um, that's how you might, that's the type of uh, project management you might use to build a bridge because you know what you're doing you really don't know what you're doing when you're getting started with something that has uh, organizational and people social complexity. Okay, so an iterative agile methodology is what's required, but what exactly is that, right? It's easy to say, you know, what is it? Well, okay, so this is our definition. Agile compliance is a group of methods based on an iterative incremental approach. That means you try to eat the elephant a bite at a time not the whole thing, or even a big part of it, right? Where compliance solutions evolve through collaboration between cross-functional teams. You don't really know the the exact kind of solution that you're going to end up with because it's going to be this evolutionary process as you go through uh, taking the steps that allow you to comply. Agile promotes adaptive planning, evolutionary development, and implementation. It's a rapid and flexible response. What you you know you. Tom Peters, um, 30 years ago, said, fail forward fast. You really need to make some mistakes so that you learn what you're doing. That's, that's part of what Agile is. You don't really understand the problem until you start uh, solving it. So it's a conceptional framework 
and acknowledges that due to the change in operational, technical, and regulatory environment, the implementation cycle never ends. Now, those of you that study the, the uh, HIPAA security rule, you should know that the security rule is not a set and forget type of thing. Okay, you should know that you should be doing risk assessments uh, at least once a year, probably once a quarter, right? Because your the second implementation specification of the security rule, the first standard risk mitigation, that's ad, that's actually the process. That's the entire process. That implementation specification swallows the entire rule. Why? Because what does it tell you to do? Oh, first you have to assess. Assess. Assess what? Assess risk. And then you have to simplify. Okay? Because you can't address all the risks that you assess uh, because of budget constraints, uh, resource constraints, etc. And then you implement controls to reduce those risks that you know to levels that are quote unquote reasonable and appropriate. And then you monitor to see if those controls are actually working. And then you report to your executive management team, reporting how well those controls are working, and then you reassess. Okay, so it's a never-ending cycle, and an agile methodology is more aptly fits that. Okay, so agile compliance is how an organization goes about changing its compliance DNA. It, it really does uh, make you think about the whole process in a different way. And if you don't change your DNA with respect to compliance, you're really going to be stuck in this mode where compliance is this necessary evil, but not something that you do on a day-to-day -day basis to add value to uh, your enterprise, to add value in, in the case of healthcare to the patient experience. So uh, it's really nothing new, you know, fell forward fast. Tom Peters was thinking about this 30 years ago, came out of urban planning. The software industry has been using it for a long time. We just adopted it for compliance. Okay, and Agile is seen as the only effective way of solving wicked problems. And what do we mean by wicked problems? We mean at wicked as in wicked hard, okay, not wicked as in evil, although, you know, there's a lot of people out there that think the security rule is evil, and I, I thought it was evil too the first time I looked at it. But this is when we call wicked problems, we're talking about wicked as in hard to solve. Okay, I'm going to pause just to take a breath and drink uh, some water here, Martin. Do we have any questions? No, but I'll tap dance for a little bit while you take a sip. I'll tap dance a little bit more. No, I'm good now. I'm good. Okay, so a wicked problem has generally has these characteristics, and sometimes you see it uh, defined a little bit different with other characteristics. But generally, you don't understand the problem until you've started developing the solution. You really don't know exactly how you're going to go about tackling uh, the security rule and implementing you know, these 29 controls that it calls for until you really get started, right? You don't know the difference exactly between an addressable implementation specification and a required implementation specification and so forth. Okay, who's going to be driving this? Is it going to be IT? Is it going to be the compliance officer? Who? Is it going to be a cross-functional team? Does one exist? You know, and so you have all these questions, and what it tends to lead to is analysis paralysis or form a committee to name a committee to, you know, get started on a problem two years from now, right? So that's, the, that's number one characteristic of uh, an agile wicked problem is that you really don't understand the problem until you start solving it. Two, there's really no stopping rule. Since there's no definitive problem, there can't be any definitive solution. If you read the, you know, the, the, the struggle that everybody goes through with the privacy rule, security rule, and breach notification rule is that it's descriptive. It just tells you what you're supposed to comply with. It doesn't tell you how, right? Our subscription plan, including Expresso now that we've developed, and Expresso allows you to do a risk assessment in three hours or less. We give you the how. We give you the how, too. Now, uh, everybody turns to the NIST documents and, you know, like, like the list documents are this sort of nirvana, right, that they, the government is actually giving you some information that, that's useful. And if you go look at the, and it is useful, it's quite useful, but not necessarily for what you thought it was initially. Because if you go look at the NIST document for implementing the security rule, here's their approach. For every requirement, what they'll say is, here are the 30 questions that you ought to be asking yourself regarding this requirement. And, I, you know, when I first saw that, I'm like, 
hey, I, I don't need 30 additional questions. I'm about to pull my hair out. I want some answers. I want some how-to. And it quickly dawned on me that the government is never going to give you how-to information because then if you followed that and you said, well, wait, 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 I did exactly it. I did it the exact way you told me, and now you're saying I'm not in compliance. Okay? So they're never going to do that. They're never going to give you specific how-to because it would totally, um, you know, destroy their ability to say, nope, you didn't do it right, or you didn't really do what was reasonable and appropriate, and all these other weasel words, right? So although the NIST documents are good reference documents, they don't really give you the how-to, okay? And so since there's no definitive problem, because they don't really tell you what the problem is, there's no definitive solution. And then, so solutions are not right or wrong. They end up being just better than others, good enough, good enough for the amount of resources that we have, good enough for the size of our organization, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And every wicked problem is unique and novel. And the reason that it's unique and novel is because your organization is unique and novel, right? Even ambulatory practice, from ambulatory practice to ambulatory practice, from hospital to hospital, you're going to go about solving the compliance problem in a totally different way. Different people are going to be involved. You've got different pecking orders. They're just different organizations. And that's why the problem is wicked. It's got organizational and social complexity more than it has technical complexity, although, granted, the security rule has its fair share, I dare say, of technical complexity as well. And every solution is a one-shot operation. And really what we mean by that is Agile says fail forward fast and iterate, iterate, iterate. And so, Carlos, how do you reconcile the fact that it's iterate, 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 but you just get one shot? And the, it, that sounds like a paradox, a contradiction. And the, the shot is how are you going to go about, what methodology are you going to pick to go about solving the HIP, your HIPAA compliance initiative wicked problem? Is it going to be agile? Is it going to be waterfall? And you pick a particular methodology, that's what you picked, and that's probably what you've got to live with. So it's really, really important to try to get the thinking right about the process and the methodology before you get started. Okay? So it turns out that big problems, really big problems, and we, we got, and as a society, we're facing all kinds of big problems, right? I mean, healthcare itself at 17% of GDP, no matter what your political persuasion is. It's just unsustainable. We can't have healthcare consuming 17% of GDP, okay? And, and that's a huge problem. That's a wicked problem. But it turns out that big problems require many, many, many small solutions. That's how you get there. You can't get there with this big bang, right? That's not how you go about solving these kinds of problems. Again, why? Because you don't really understand the problem well enough until you start experimenting and more experiments, and then you get a little smarter and you say, oh, okay, now I understand, right? Now I understand. So the most important thing you can do from an agile perspective is just get started, right? And that's why we give you like 19 mini project plans in our subscription that tells you, hey, get started here. You, you need policies, here's our model privacy policy, our model security rule policy, our model breach notification policy, our model social media policy, present them to the executive management team, distribute it to the organization, get signatures from, from everybody. Hey, ticky mark, you're done with that requirement. Okay? It's rules say you gotta train people. We'll take our training. If you're the compliance officer, we got fifteen or so training modules. Decide what subs subset of those are going to be taught to everybody and then have everybody watch the videos, have everybody take the exams, have the exams be graded. If, it, if people get a seventy uh, percent or better then they don't have to take the exam again. Just get started with these tasks that we've kind of chumped up for you, okay? That is the most important thing that you can do. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there uh, with, with these tools, even if you purchased our subscription plan, still looking at, okay, I got all these tools, but where, 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 do, where do I start? And the answer is, well, just pick a place and start, right? But we give you some suggestions. That's what we've done with these 19 mini uh, project plan. So Agile is definitely not old school compliance. A couple years ago, we were the only ones talking about Agile compliance. Right now, you hear a lot of people talking about Agile. If you go to our LinkedIn group, you see some discussion about Agile and a mixture of an Agile and Waterfall and, and so forth. Right? And the reason why this is called 21st century 
compliance is. This is going to be the way you, you do compliance going forward. And not, not, not only HIPAA compliance, it's not only to do with just HIPAA. You know, it could be cyber, you know, uh, Sar Sarbanes-Oxley, you know, it could be OSHA, it, you name the, reg the regulatory scheme that you're trying to comply with, right? And agile compliance will be the, the preferred methodology going forward, as opposed to this kind of this old formal, you got governance and you got compliance and risk management, it's kind of had this academic approach that compliance officers um, kind of invented, I guess, to justify their own existence, I don't know, but this kind of formal process really doesn't work in practice. When, for example, the threat landscaping, the landscape, the bad guys are getting smarter every single day, right? You're getting different kinds of ransomware attacks every single day. This old formal static model just doesn't work anymore. You need a more responsible, more flexible model, okay? And you need to stop thinking as risk as this necessary evil or compliance as this necessary evil. The risk doesn't go away. Uh, to be contained, and this is just something that you do. Privacy and security is just something that you do to add that adds to the patient experience, that adds to the reputation of your organization, that adds to the value of services that you deliver to your customers. In this case, patients. Right? You need to change the old school thinking as this, uh, you know, thinking of compliance as this necessary evil to a, something that you do as part of your value proposition. For example, like the financial services industry had to do when they went online, right? The, the compliance for them and security for them wasn't like this bolt-on necessary evil. It was at the heart of their business. Okay, now healthcare, healthcare, the healthcare industry is far from that, but it's finally starting to turn the corner a little bit. Okay, and ransomware is a big part of that, where the light now is coming on and saying, "Oh, wait a minute, we need to be doing these things anyway." Yes, the government requires us to do it in the security rule, but really if we want to protect our patient data, we should be doing this and more. Okay, so should, compliance should become part of your value proposition and agile is the methodology, um, the best methodology we think that helps get you there. Now Martin, I'm still assuming that uh, there are no questions. Not at this time. Okay, so what is agile compliance? It's something that adds value and enhances the customer experience. And it turns out that this soft stuff, right, these methodologies, you know, the, the, that we're thinking about and, you know, it, it being iterative and changing the DNA and dealing with people and organizational issues, that really is the hard stuff. The technology here is not the hard stuff, right? That's why the biggest mistake any organization can make is just throw the compliance problem over to IT, thinking it's a technical problem. It's not, it's got a technical component but it's mostly an organizational and people problem. And so you're not gonna solve it if you just throw it over to IT, okay? The fact of the matter is that everybody's compliance initiatives is being disrupted because the entire healthcare industry is being disrupted, okay? From, you know, from meaningful use and the push to electronic health records seven years ago, right, based on the High Tech Act and meaningful use provided money to providers now, you know, now mostly everybody's on electronic health records to now uh, CMS pushing for pay for performance, accountable care organizations to transition the ICD-10, uh, obviously the Affordable Care Act, quality measures that you have to meet to be uh, uh, compensated appropriately and not penalized, pricing transparency that patients are asking for, because why is this procedure the same exact pr procedure why does it cost three times more in this hospital B across town than it costs at hospital A? And the hospitals themselves can't even tell you because they don't even know, they don't track costs because you know they didn't they 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 always relied on negotiating with a particular payer, and the payers kind of drove what they would pay, right? and so you know that that was it. Right? You didn't, there wasn't really a customer. The customer wasn't paying. It was either the government through Medicare or Medicaid or some private insurance company, right? There, there is no such thing right now. Even right now, there's no such thing as pricing transparency for procedures across, um, you know, across providers. You, you don't see that at all, right? Not, I mean, totally unlike the consumer electronics market where you've seen quality continually go up at the same time that price is coming down. 
okay? In healthcare, you see the complete opposite. You see quality going down and costs going up, right? And that's what's unsustainable, and that's why, you know, mobile health, bring your own device, mergers and acquisitions, telemedicine, big data and analytics, it, it, it feels like the entire healthcare industry is going through 150 years of change in five, okay? And, and, and it's going to continue to go through that kind of change. And, you know, the pace of innovation is accelerating, right? We're competing in internet time, and the healthcare industry was really not renowned for being an innovator, not with respect to back office sorts of things, payment models was always fee for service. I mean, all this stuff is kind of being shoved down the industry's throat, and not all of it by the government, a lot of it just by market forces. You know, fee for service is kind of dead. Everybody wants, you know, pay for performance. Everybody wants, you know, uh, to pay for outcomes, to pay for results, right? I mean, imagine that you took your car to get fixed because the brakes were bad, and you know, when you got them back, the brakes were still bad, but the mechanic said, no, no, you got to pay me. Well, what do you mean I got to pay you? You didn't fix the brakes. Well, I did. I did this procedure. You know, I did something, and you got to pay me. Well, that's what the docs do. They don't, they do something. They do a procedure. They don't really care if it worked or not. They get paid by, that's called fee for service. That's been the model for 150 years in the healthcare industry. Now it's being turned upside down. Well, what does that got to do with, you know, HIPAA and compliance? Well, you know, since there's all that change going on anyway, this is an opportune time to uh, to help if you're the compliance officer or you're the uh, doctor to help rethink your compliance strategy as well. Your old compliance strategy prior to the High Tech Act that's dead. That's DOA. Okay, with breach notification, with ransomware, you got to be thinking different about you know privacy and security. Okay, it's not going to go away. It's not because Obama got elected. It's not. It doesn't have anything to do with Obamacare. It's not going. It's not going away because it's dependent on this 365, 24/7 online world that we lived in. The world changed, and healthcare is now catching up and trying to catch up to the 21st century. So, all that is sort of background before we kind of jump into agile and how we think about agile. There, no, there are no questions yet. I, I can only assume they're just transfixed, mesmerized. Okay, so we borrowed, we borrowed this from the risk management framework for NIST. And I, I forget, actually, uh, I should have wrote it down, but what exactly, which special publication. But if you do a, a, um, you know, a Google search on NIST special publications, You'll find one of the 800 series has to do with risk uh, mitigation and risk management, right? And uh, you see that it's this circular process. Assess, what does that mean? Well, it's do your first risk assessment and identify the risks that you're going to uh, try to reduce and identify the controls that you're going to implement to reduce those risks to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Now, Espresso, that's what Espresso does, right? Espresso is our risk assessment product that we just released software as a service, okay? It comes pre-populated with 150 risks. It already identifies all the controls that you need to comply with in the security rule, in the security rule. But you don't have to implement all, uh, you don't have to solve all 150 the first time because you may not have the resources, uh, either the, the, the people resources or the financial resources to get it all done. So out of those, 150 risks, simplify and pick which ones you're going to attack during this risk assessment. And then protect, what does protect mean? Well, a risk assessment is exactly that. It's analysis step. It's where you identify the risk and you identify the controls that you're going to implement, but you actually don't do the work to implement them. It's the risk mitigation implementation specification where you actually do the work. So that's protect. That's actually implement the controls, okay? And then what do you do? You monitor because you got to figure out whether or not they're working, right? If you implemented a bunch of controls but they're not working, then really you haven't reduced the risk, the risk uh, to a level that's reasonable and appropriate. Right? You got to implement some additional control, and then you got to report so that you can keep track of where you're at. And and we provide you scorecards. For example, in our subscription plan, if the the privacy rule scorecard. The, 
security rules scorecard. And these are scorecards based on each and in all the individual requirements, all 169 requirements that are in the rules. We allow you to track where where am I in this in, in this uh, you know in, in, in this project of implementing and meeting all these 169 requirements, and then what do you do? Then you conduct another assessment, and this cycle never ends. And that's why we say that the risk mitigation implementation specification essentially swallows the entirety of the security rule, although the way it's broken down, it, you know, HHS actually decided to break down a risk assessment or risk analysis and then have that same risk analysis be part of this kind of recursive process that you do over and over and over again. They split it into two. Why? God only knows. But this assessment here is a another risk assessment. It's really what they're telling you is that it's not set and forget. It's not just once in a lifetime, right? It's we recommend at least once a year. And with Espresso, Espresso allows you to keep all your risk assessments. You could go back and report on the risk assessment that you did two years ago. And we would still have all the risk that you had that you implemented, the controls that you implemented it. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, essentially, though, at the end of the day, agile is going to be what you say it is. It's how you iterate, right? Agile, like we said, agile is going to be different, even from ambulatory practice to ambulatory practice, right? It's not going to be the same. Why? It's not the same organization. It's not the same people. It's not the same pecking order. It's not the same personalities, is right? The 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 social and organizational complexity is going to vary between hospital and hospital, between ambulatory and ambulatory, right? So, at the end, you're going to come up with your own custom uh, agile but here's some key definitions uh, the way we look at it okay and we've just broken it up into what we call some chunks so that you have a place to start so that even if you buy our espresso and you do your risk assessment and you have we have these 30 other products that help you with the mitigation you can actually have these project plans that say, hey, go do these things. So you're not staring at that, branch, that blank sheet of paper. And those project plans are written, are, are written with this grammar in mind that we're going to go over right now. A track means a set of related chunks. Okay, tracks, tracks go on indefinitely, meaning the work in the track is continuous over time. There's technically no end to a track, okay, like your risk mitigation track. And that's, that's what the rule calls for. That was a recursive, repeatable process, okay. Um, a chunk means a set of related compliance tasks. It's the su smallest unit of visible demonstrable evidence of compliance, right? Usually a chunk is what you do to satisfy a requirement, okay? And chunk, chunks have tasks. You have to do this. If you want to solve your training uh, requirement for the privacy rule, you got to do this, 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 and this. And if you did, if you did those five tasks, then you satisfy that one requirement, right? And so chunks are estimated based on the amount of effort to complete each individual task, like any old project plan, including any documentation required for the chunk. And the outcome of the chunk should be reflected in your H2 scorecard because the scorecard keeps track of the requirements, okay? It keeps track of the requirements, and a chunk is aligned with the requirements. So once you've done a chunk, a chunk, you can say, hey, okay, little ticky mark, I got that requirement, Matt. You do another chunk, and we've we've uh, decomposed uh, the rules into these chunks that get you most of the way there. A task is the most atomic verb based action of compliance activity. A task is something that you do, something that gets done. Okay. A requirement is a must perform action. A, you know, a, there used to be this, all this, there still are a lot of myths around HIPAA, but there used to be this myth of the 42 questions that you could be asked during a HIPAA audit and all this sort of nonsense. And, and that's because nobody ever got audited prior to the High Tech Act. Right now, the High Tech Act mandated audits, and HHS is in round two of its audits and, uh, and so forth. But look, you don't have to guess what they're going to ask you questions on. The, the, the protocol that HHS published, those 169 requirements, they did nothing more but look at the rules and say, these are the requirements that are in the rules. Well, that's what we did. Long before they published their protocol, that's how we built our checklist. We understood that the only possible thing they could ask you to comply with was a requirement that was contained in the rules. So our job was to go figure out what those requirements were and then provide you how-to advice to go about 
attacking those requirements. It's not that hard. I mean, it is hard. It is a monster, but you don't have to be guessing. The requirements are right there in the rules, right? And so, you know, when when HHS published this uh, audit protocol, everybody thought this was a glorious thing. All they did was go get the requirements out of the rules, right? They were always there. There's no need to guess the 42 questions because they, they can't make up requirements that aren't in the law. they got to ask you about the requirements that are in the law. Okay, so in all, all of you, I'm sure, have heard our compliance equation in different seminars. you got to have policies plus processes that underpin the policy plus tracking results and have visible demonstrable evidence for each and every requirement. That's got to be at the granularity level of a requirement, okay? For example, training. you got to have a policy regarding training. We train our people once a year, or we train our people within three weeks of hiring. We train whatever the material, um, there are material changes in the law. We, you know, that's your policy. Okay, but if you don't have organizational processes that underpin the policy, then the policy is just a bunch of flowery language. Right? It doesn't mean anything. So you, you got to have some processes. Are you, are you going to do classroom training? Is it video-based training? Is there a test? What's the passing score? And then finally, how do you track the results that Dr. Jane uh, got uh, tested on this particular day and on what, and uh, Dr. Joe on this particular day, Nurse Sarah, the receptionist, where are the results, all right? You have to, if I'm an auditor, I'm going to say, I want to see your training policy, I want you to talk to me about your training processes, okay, and I want to see a document that says where, where you have them, and I want to see the database that tracks process results. And I'm talking about training, one requirement. I want to see the visible, demonstrable evidence that you have complied with this particular requirement. That's all they can ask you about, okay? So policy, process, result, right, for, for each requirement, and you're prepared for an audit. And essentially, our audit training series, that's what we go through, okay? Now, as far as the chunks and the project plans, we've broke them up into these categories. They were kind of arbitrary, okay? foundational chunks, core chunks, essential chunks. We were just trying to get you sort of, you know, uh, pointed in the right direction and say, hey, okay, yeah, do the foundation stuff first, because that, that to us appears to be foundational. You have to have a risk assessment, name your privacy officer, distribute your policies, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then go on and tackle the core chunks. And and as you're moving through these, you're getting, you're, you're dealing with, you know, some of this 169, and eventually all of the 169 requirements. Okay, so here's an example of a chunk. It's got a name, disseminate model policies. It's got a track, it's the foundation track, and here are the tasks. Hey, present the models to the executive team, make any changes that you need to make, allow the executive team to review the final policies, distribute them, get them signed, collect them, and put it in everybody's personnel folder, and guess what? You just met the the requirement of having policies and procedures, right? And, and in our subscription plan, we give you those out of the box that you can modify. So you're not working with a blank sheet of paper. You got the policies. You know, here they are, just and they came out of the checklist, just you know, change them to your organization and distribute them, teach, you know, make people make sure people read them and you can say, hey, okay, we got that job done. Training. Okay, that's also that's another chunk that's also foundational. Introduce the training program to the executive team. Say, hey, we're going to train all our staff on privacy rules, security rules, breach notification, social media, and cloud, or whatever. Whatever you, your compliance officer decides of the 15 uh, training modules that we have and growing, which ones are you going to train uh, everybody on, which ones are you going to train your, your compliance officer, security officer on, and their staff, et cetera, et cetera. You come up with a plan, and you perform the training, and you capture the fact that that someone with that training, we provide you a spreadsheet, right? If you don't have, you don't need, absolutely have to have the sophisticated software that tracks that. You can track it in a spreadsheet if you had to, okay? Um, and this is part two of training and awareness. And so we break it down. It's kind of broken down like this. You get a risk management program. You got a bunch of tracks. Tracks have some chunks underneath them. Each chunk has multiple tasks, and that's how you go about getting started. Just pick somewhere and get started and start doing stuff and then go to the scorecard and say, oh, I just met that requirement. Okay, I, oh, I just met this other requirement because I did that chunk. And you say, okay, uh, all right, I think, I'm, I think I get this. I think I understand how, 
how this works. Now you've got a methodology that you can actually talk to an auditor about or a court of law, right? You should be in that good compliance story ca category because you, you have you, your head's now been unstuck out of the sand. You can say, no, we have a a a a, a method a method to this madness. Here's how we attack our initiative. Here's how we keep score. Uh, Mr. Auditor, of where we're at, okay? Because HHS doesn't expect you to be fully compliant day one. Nobody's going to be fully compliant day one. I mean, we're really not day one now. We're seven years out. You should have gotten started. If you haven't gotten started, you're definitely going to be in willful neglect. But the fact of the matter is full compliance is this aspirational goal, and you're always going to be getting better and better at at what? You're going to be getting better and better at producing visible demonstrable evidence of compliance of those 169. Okay, because you may implement it, but maybe you don't have all the training you think you need. Okay, or maybe you need to update your policies for certain reasons, or etc. It's 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 a process that doesn't end. You just get better and better at it. Okay, so pick a chunk and a task and get started. So, well, we do have some a question, and one of our webinar attendees was nice enough to send in. Uh, the NIST document number for the assess risk assessment continuum, and it's NIST 800-39. And the question okay. that we do we do have to uh, uh, do we have to track slash audit every single standard? Yes, I mean every standard is a every standard is a requirement, right? If you look at the OCR protocol. You know, I'm not making up these numbers, right? They they, they, they they come up with 169 because some they break up some standards into subparts, okay? When you actually look at our checklist, we cover all those requirements, but sometimes we don't end up as, as many because we consolidate some of the subparts, okay? But essentially, those 169 requirements, 78 came from the privacy rule, 81, I think, came from the security rule, and 10 from breach notification, something like that. And you got, yes, the answer is you got to comply with every single one of those. Every single one, you got to show visible demonstrable evidence of. Okay? That's that's it. That's it. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. Yes, it's harder, you know, than just talking about it. But the answer is absolutely yes, you have to show that. That's what it's all about. So there's no there's no mystery anymore. There shouldn't be. I, I, I wouldn't say that there isn't. There, there is still a lot of mystery, but look. We, we provide you tools to do exactly that so that you can show, we give you suggestions, we give you the policy, the processes, and suggested tracking mechanisms for all 169 of those requirements so that you can show that, hey, we've gotten started, we've complied with these, we haven't complied with these, but we know they exist, and we intend to, we got a plan, you know, where we're going to get, we're going to get to that. We just haven't gotten to it yet. And then if you can do that, then you can make a good faith argument that you're not in willful neglect. And you may get slapped on the wrist, you know, I mean, unless you have a major breach, and then that's going to ruin your day, and you're going to, you know, spend millions of dollars unless you were smart enough and you encrypted all your PHI so that you could take advantage of your safe harbor. But the long and short answer is yes. You have to show visible demonstrable evidence for all 169 of those requirements. Uh, the second question that's generated out of, when you say evidence, what does that consist of? In what format? Okay, well, evidence is, like I, like I said, if you tell me you have a training policy, I'm going to say, okay, let me see the policy. I'm an auditor. I'm, I'm, I'm an auditor. I'm asking you about your training policy. Then I'm going to ask you, well, tell me about the process. And you're going to say, you know, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it classroom-based? Is that how you do it? Is it video-based? Do, do your students have to take a test? Who do you train, right? Who's the instructor? What's your process, right? And is it written down? Can you, you know, and if it's written down, I'll read the document. When I say evidence, I want to see evidence that your people got trained. When did you train this, this particular doctor? When did you train this nurse? When did you train? If you don't have that captured in a spreadsheet or in some document that's evidence, that's what I mean, documentary evidence that you actually did what you said you were going to do. Because if you can't show me that you did what you said you were going to do, then you don't have visible demonstrable evidence. I'm going to infer that you didn't do it. Right? I'm not just going to accept your word that because you've got a, a policy that says has all this flowery stuff, we're going to do X, Y, Z, blah, 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 and 
oh yeah, we have this training once a year, and but you have no results that you, you can't show me any evidence, a spreadsheet or anything else that you ever trained anybody, I'm going to say, well, you're probably in willful neglect. You can't show me any evidence. How, how can I assume that you did what you said you were going to do? Is that clear? That's what we mean by visible demonstrable evidence. Evidence. Documents that show, that prove that you actually did what you said you were going to do in your policy. Okay? And that's what we mean in our checklist is we give you the policy. Here's the, here's the suggested policy for this requirement. Okay? Here are the suggested processes that you should implement, right, to support this policy. And here, number three is, here's how we think you should go about tracking this. Use this spreadsheet. A lot of times we'll give you a template or a spreadsheet, you know, or suggest other ways that you track it so that you can show evidence that you've actually, you actually did comply with this requirement. Okay, the next question is, so how do the 2016 audit protocols play into this as they provide questions leading to the path of evidence? No, I think I'm, I'm not. Evidently, I may not be making myself clear. Those, 100, those audit protocol between phase one and phase two, they barely change it. But they're just rules. If you look at that, if you look at that, they're just references to 164.308 administrative safeguards and then some of the implementation specifications. And then they probably, they're just regulatory references. You can go out to the HIPAA Survivor Guide website and look at them. They're just the law. They're just the regulations. Okay? There's no mystery here. Right? That's, that's what I've been trying to tell you. All this whole mystery is because people haven't gotten serious about understanding the requirements of HIPAA. Okay, they've been there all along. OCR just published them in a list, and everybody said, oh, my God, it's the holy grail. No, it's just the requirements. They've always been there. And so when you say, how should we go, that's what I'm telling you is that we take those requirements and we tell you, here's your suggested policy. You know, there's no other way to deal with it, by the way. It, this could be Sarbanes-Oxley. This could be OSHA. You, this is general compliance theory, if you will. You have to deal with compliance at the granularity level of a requirement. And if you don't understand the requirements, then how can you possibly comply? Right? That's the first thing as an auditor I want to know. Do you understand what the requirements are? If not, I'm going to find you in willful neglect. You don't even know what the requirements are. So if you don't know what they are, there's no way on God's earth that you can possibly be compliant. Right? And so that's the, that's the 101. You got to understand what the requirements are, and and H, all HHS all HHS did was take all those requirements and the rules, and they put them in a spreadsheet, and they added them up, and they said, "Yep, there's 169 of them. That's what you got to comply with." They don't tell you how; they just tell you the what. But the government's never going to tell you the how. We covered that, right? That's okay. all we have. Okay, so this is just what you get. If you buy our subscription, we've broken up these chunks for you. We have these checklists. We have these mini project plans, and we try to help you get started in an agile way. We have these scorecards where you can go in, and these are all this. This is our breakdown of, of the privacy rule requirements. The reason that we don't have as many as uh, the protocol has is because they sometimes take that a like the first requirement and break it up into five different subcomponents and we said you know what this is really just one requirement you know and we so we deal with the five components in one we've simplified a little bit right but this is what our scorecards do and you can say you give you give it a value missing we haven't done it at all one is okay we know about it we know we got to do it it's planned we got it on a plan but we haven't done it yet all right which is better than not being aware of it uh, a value of two says, you know what, we implemented it, we're not crazy happy with it, but it's a basic implementation, at least we did something. You know, three says, hey, it's functional, it's been working for six months, and you come up with a score. Or, you know that if you got zero, you haven't even thought about it, right? This one means, hey, it's on our plan, we know we got to get to it. So the scorecards that we give you is a way to keep track of where you're at in compliance, okay? And for the security rule, same thing. 
Okay, we, we've done some consolidations and we've done some expansions, but essentially we're covering the 81 requirements uh, of, and this comes out of our checklist. Now for each one of these, you know, our checklist isn't like this 10 easy steps to do comply with HIPAA. It's for every requirement, describes the requirement, gives you a reference to the law, gives you references to tools we have that may help you, and gives you, again, gives you the three things that you need. Gives you the suggested policy, the suggested underlying processes, and the suggested tracking mechanisms that, that you can implement so that you can get that process results, which is the evidence at the end of the day. All right? So you need all three. All three of them are evidence, but process results is the most important kind of evidence because it really demonstrates that, that you're actually doing what you said you were going to do. Um, and we also have specialized scorecards for cloud, social media, and mobile requirements. This is just because we decided that these were so important that we should highlight them a little bit more. Okay? We also have it for a breach notification, but the breach notification, the 10 breach notification requirements are really preparedness requirements. It's like, do you have model letters? Do you have a way of thinking about when breach notification gets triggered? Yada, yada, yada. So our breach notification framework, okay, we don't call that one a checklist, we call it a framework, but that's essentially what it it is. It, it walks you through uh, the analytical framework for determining when a breach is triggered. It has model letters, model ways to contact media, et cetera, et cetera. So we feel like with Espresso, we've given you a SaaS-based pro uh, product that you can do a risk assessment in three hours or less where you identify the risk. And with the remainder of our products, we've given you a set of 30-some-odd products that help you mitigate the risk. <laughs> so, you know, what's our recommendation? Get busy. Get started. It's the most important thing that you can do. It's not really the work in progress that causes the biggest delay. It's the, desist, the decisions in progress. Make a decision. Make a decision. I don't know, Martin, why I have a hard time. I'm part French, so I have a hard time with that word sometimes. Make a decision and, like, judge's decisions. i got to practice saying that word. Make a decision, get started, and go. Okay, buy our stuff, buy somebody else's stuff, some tools, you know, but whatever. Get started and, and, and don't delay because if you delay, you're going to be found to be in willful neglect. Here's a little math for you. Uh, I don't really uh, care to go over it that much, but a little chaos theory is involved here uh, as far as why Agile actually works. Okay, and it turns out that when you're trying to solve a really, really hard problem, a really, really tough problem, the solution space is so large, you can't even imagine how big it is. Once you start making decisions, all right, I nailed it that time, Martin. Once you start making decisions, then the solution space gets cut in half, maybe, and then in another half, and you start getting closer and closer to something that is really a system that you can implement. Okay, so there is some there is some uh, method to the madness, but the best. It's not to just, if you're looking for the best solution, it's not just the enemy of the good, it's the enemy, period, okay? Because Agile is premised on the fact that you don't even understand the problem you're solving um, until you start solving it. And to me, not to denigrate anybody, and I don't know who asked what question, but the fact that you're still confused about what those 69 things that, that uh, HHS published and what that is and what they mean tells me that, you really haven't started solving the the, the problem yet because you don't need, because you don't understand that those are the requirements that have always been in the rules and you know this audit protocol is this mystical audit protocol is kind of laughable in a way because you know for us for us veterans they just took the they just took the rules and put them in a spreadsheet do more study less patch first ask questions later embrace the chaos okay any questions martin not at this time, uh, but I, I have a question. Uh, do you think uh, the results of the death audits that were just done will encourage HHS to do more death audits? I, I think more death audits are coming because, you know, they could, they could hire an army of interns and they could ask everybody, show me your results from your risk assessment. And, uh, you know, 60% of the people are probably not going to be able to provide anything that looks like a risk assessment, visible demonstrable evidence, and 
I, I think maybe uh, most of you don't know it, but the High Tech Act said that any money that HHS collects, it's actually the Office of Civil Rights, as fines from HIPAA, goes back into their own coffers for more enforcement action. So HHS really has a virtual money machine, actually. Okay, and I, I would not be surprised, uh, especially as uh, you know, the, the the government gets starved for money, that HHS doesn't start doing mo more and more desk audits, because it's a way of generating, you know, this using this virtual money machine to do more enforcement action. So I expect to see a lot more desk audit comments. Because what does it cost? You know, here's ten, in ten days, provide us these documents. <coughs> if you can't provide them you're probably going to be found to be in willful neglect. So here's a shameless plug. This is an old presentation, okay? We don't sell our subscription plan now for $7.95 a year. We actually sell it for $2,500, right? It's actually $2,495, right? But it, but it comes with Espresso. That's a, a software as a service that lets you do uh, a risk assessment three hours or less, lets you save historical risk assessments over time. And now the renewal fee year over year, if you want to continue access to all your risk assessments and all the new products that we're going to enable, like we're we're going to come out with a certification, a HIPAA certification product here, uh, with where we take all our training and make it available, and then you have to get a 70% score, and then we'll issue you a, a certificate saying you're 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 certified uh, by the HIPAA survival guide as having passed this exam, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, we like to think that we provide the recipe, not just the ingredients. Uh, we provide our mission is to make uh, provide educational products that you can execute on day one. We've been doing these free seminars now for over five years. We've been doing a free newsletter for over five years. Uh, the feedback that we've gotten from the marketplace is what's gone into our products, uh, and we hope to make continue to make them better and better. Now, every time you get a new product under our subscription plan, you don't have to pay anything more. You just get it as part of the subscription, right? So your your subscription continues to gain value um, over time. <coughs> um, we believe our approach really is different than a, a lot of our competitors, so it's set no substitute. Uh, and if there's no questions, then it's been my pleasure being with you today. We have a uh, question. Okay. Uh, we have a risk management committee who meets quarterly to handle risk management concerns, meeting minutes, etc. And we track these on a risk management plan. Is that a good way to start documenting? No, that's an absolutely terrible way to, to document because that's not the way that 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 um, this, That's not the way you do a risk assessment. Right? The way you do a risk assessment, according to NIST, who is the Bible now, is you have to get threats, you have to match threat, vulnerability pairs, all right? And then you have to say, you have to come up with a probability of this threat actually exploiting this vulnerability. And if that happened, and that probability is not mathematical, by the way, it's high, medium, or low. But if that happened, what sort of impact would it do to your business? And that impact is given a high, medium, or low probability. And then overall, the risk is calculate, calculated as a function of essentially TV times I. The probability that this threat will execute this vulnerability times the impact to your organization, then that leads you a subjective high, medium, or low risk. Okay? And you have to try, try you know, so what is, so how do we do it in Espresso? Well, the rule, the security rule says you have to have a, you have to have a, um, disaster recovery plan. That's one of the that's one of the implementation specifications. Okay, if you don't have a disaster recovery plan, that's a vulnerability that all kinds of threats can exploit. So just having risk management at some hundred thousand feet of abstraction and minutes, that's not. You got to get down to the level of a threat vulnerability pair and determining the risk to your organization. If you're not down at that level, then you, you may be doing something that you call risk management, but you're not doing risk management in the way that HIPAA requires. Now, I, I will back this up a little bit. Um, this is a client of ours that uses Expresso, and what they're using the, the management meetings for is to 
expand beyond any risk that may be unusual to their particular practice. So uh, in that case, oh, I would... Oh, yeah, sure now. Yeah, okay, so if you're using the management, you know, uh, committee to say we need more resources for this, or we should do, be doing a better job. Yes, we implemented this control, but we should be implementing three more controls because we're still exposed with this risk. Then that's fine. That's what you ought to be doing, right? If you, you and you get the reports out of Expresso as to you know what you've identified as high, medium, or low. Now you're you know now you're dealing with it at the right at the right level. My my first impression was that that there there were these management meetings going on, but no no detailed support underneath where you actually had identified which risk and which controls you had implemented. And that's all the questions we have at the moment. Well, great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for listening. That You're going to be hearing more and more about Agile compliance. And uh, uh, Martin records all this. We make them available periodically uh, so that you and your colleagues can uh, listen to them again. Obviously, our subscribers get all of them. So they'll just be on on you know customer hub where our products are, and you can just uh, click. I think it, I think it takes uh, Martin probably you know half a day to get them out there. So tomorrow, uh, this one will probably be out there. Um, thanks again, and we'll uh, see you next time.